start this morning with a question. Have uh, any of you been up to the intersection at 14th Street and Superior lately? I know some of you live up there and so um, you realize probably multiple times a day what a mess that is right now. As others of you might know this intersection by its reputation and I don't know that it's necessarily that good <laughs> of a reputation. There's this huge roundabout, if you're unfamiliar with it. It's a huge roundabout, and it's under construction. I think it was under construction when Todd and I moved here two years ago. And like so many streets and intersections in Lincoln, it seems like it is perpetually under construction. Kind of like 70th Street, right in front of St. E's. Well, roundabouts are popping up all throughout Lincoln, as this picture shows you. The yellow, and I, don't, I know it's kind of hard to differentiate the colors, the yellow signs are the existing roundabouts in the city of Lincoln, and the orange, kind of burnt, burnt orange color, are the proposed roundabouts, or those that are under construction. And roundabouts are one of those things folks either seem to love them, or they hate them. There is no in-between. You love them or you hate them. Now proponents of roundabouts claim that they are the answer to traffic congestion and problems associated with the growth of a community and all of the additional cars and traffic that that growth brings with it. Those who do not like roundabouts, avoid them like the plague, sometimes driving miles out of their way to avoid having to go through a roundabout and join this never-ending parade of cars going around in a circle. But as this picture shows us, love them or hate them, we're going to be seeing a lot more of them. Now, studies have been conducted on the effectiveness of these roundabouts, and these studies have shown several things. As crazy as this seems, roundabouts have been shown to, be ac at, to actually be safer. They cause less air and noise pollution, and they are more efficient than the traditional stop-and-go traffic that you can that we are used to experiencing at an intersection. When there are accidents in the roundabouts, they are usually less severe because people are not driving as fast. They're going at a slower pace rather than barreling through the intersection in an, in an attempt to make that green light, even though it might be yellow or even a little bit red. Arizona is a state that utilizes roundabouts a lot. During the last 40 years, the population of Arizona has increased by 40 percent. And studies there have shown that injuries at traffic, injuries in traffic accidents at roundabout intersections are down by 75 percent and that the number of fatal accidents have decreased by 90% because of the use of roundabouts. Experts conclude that taking away the need, or maybe it's the temptation to beat the red light, leads to slower speeds and thus safer driving. Now what makes roundabouts successful, what makes them be able to be navigated is cooperation rather than competition. And if roundabouts had existed in the first century, the Apostle Paul might have used them as an example for how we are to order our church lives. Now, just as with churches today, some people would enthusiastically take on the idea of an, 
uh, the challenge of a new idea and say, yes, let's try something new. While others in chorus would sing together, but we've never done it that way. Yet roundabouts can teach us a lesson about how we survive within community. People have to pay attention to one another in order to navigate a roundabout. The challenge to get through is instructing drivers on this new, improved way of working with one another. It takes a certain amount of patience and education and goodwill on everybody's part. But once drivers are accustomed to the new traffic circle, efficiency is improved and safety is increased. The traffic patterns could be instructive to anyone attempting to live and work together. In his second letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth, Paul gives the Christians there a benediction. It's the closing thoughts of the letter. And oftentimes, people overlook the ending of this letter, thinking that all of the important stuff comes before. But in this case, in this closing, in this benediction, Paul is sharing insight into what it means to live together in Christian community. He's teaching us how to live and act as the church and as the body of Christ. The subtitle for this section of scripture is called Final Greetings and Benedictions. Let me share these words with you now. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. And they say this, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Now, lest you get worried, I have been reappointed to Havelock. This is not a farewell sermon. <laughs> a benediction is the last good word. It offers worshipers a blessing to carry with them as they depart for the world waiting outside. We receive one every week at the end of worship. The benediction in this letter, with this benediction, Paul leaves readers with some thoughts that are very easy to understand and yet very important for us to consider. It's almost so easy that we don't realize the magnitude of what Paul is saying. It's essentially a to-do list. Some last-minute reminders that Paul wants them to take care of. He's saying, listen to me. Put things in order. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And with these instructions, Paul, or with these words, rather, Paul is instructing the Christians in Corinth on how to live together as the body of Christ. A little background on this church in Corinth. It was a mess. They had a lot of issues. It was very dysfunctional, and there was no fun in this dysfunction. And they would send letters to Paul asking questions about who is right and who is wrong. Now, the questions came in the form of things like, who is really an apostle? Who is wise and who isn't? Can we eat food that has been offered to idols, or can we not? But when you cut through all of the questions and you get to the common denominator of all of them, the bottom line we end up with is, I think this, he thinks that, which one of us is right? It 
those are the questions that came in the first letter that Paul received. And his response to them is 1 Corinthians. About 18 months later, they send him another letter. I imagine if you're Paul, you're probably just going, oh, not again. But in the second letter, we find that the church is still having issues. Throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is covering topics like forgiveness, repentance, reconciliation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there is a personal reason that Paul is writing this. When he visited the church for the second time, a member of the congregation had publicly humiliated or insulted him. So he was writing this as his own personal response to this person. But I also wonder how much of it was written for the members who had ended up on the wrong side of the first letter. Those people who Paul disagreed with when he answered these questions and he said, this is the way it is, the people who felt the opposite way were wrong. How many of those answers had left them with a bitter feeling, a bad taste in their mouth? Well, at any rate, Paul concludes this second letter with this benediction, knowing that if the Corinthians will follow his advice, they will be better off, and he will receive fewer letters of complaint and deal with less drama the next time he goes and visits the church. So now it's up to these Christians to take these instructions that he leaves them to heart and to try and change their behavior. I think it's probably a given that most organizations, most people, desire to live in peace. Now, there's always going to be those exceptions. There's always going to be those who crave anxiety and drama and upheaval, and they will do whatever they have to do to create that in their life because that's what they're comfortable with. But I think for the most of us, we aren't like that. We like calm. We like peace. We say that we want to live in peace, but the challenge is in the process of doing so. Because oftentimes, our behaviors, our actions, our words do not lead us to peace. We're told that we need to live in peace. Paul is telling us right here, live in peace. But how do we do it? How do we get to that place where we can live in peace? Well, we can't just decide, I'm going to live in peace. And that's the end of it. We can't say that we are just going to agree with others and get along with others. We can't say it. There has to be some action. There has to be some concerted effort. Does it require sacrificing strong opinions for the sake of the community? The answer is yes. But too often we think that that is a sacrifice that must be made by others and not ourselves. Why? Because I'm right and they're wrong. Sometimes we have to bite our tongues. Sometimes we shouldn't say what we are thinking. Sometimes what we're thinking needs to be said, but we might need to figure out a different way of saying it. Sometimes we have to be willing to agree to disagree. Sometimes we have to be willing to work around others in the roundabout instead of just barreling through, oblivious to the other cars. I can't recall our society being as contentious 
as it seems to be right now. I guess maybe that means I'm getting old because I'm sure countless generations before me have said the same thing. But it seems like it's reaching a new level as of late. I don't know, maybe you feel the same way, maybe you don't. I would suggest that we, as a society, as a culture, as a church, don't take this benediction of Paul's to heart. We are so concerned with being right that we have forgotten how to be kind. We have forgotten how to be generous. We have forgotten our call as Christians. As followers of and, and we as followers of Christ are just as apt to fall into this trap as unchurched people, this desire to be right. The only difference is we claim that we are right in the name of God. The decision that we face today, today is this. What is more important to us? Being right or being a follower of Jesus. If it's more important to be right, then no additional change is necessary. But if it's more important to be a follower of Jesus, then we need to follow him. We need to follow his example. I challenge you to find a place in scripture where Jesus stands and argues back and forth with someone. Yes, there are places where he gets angry. He even took the whips to the temple once. There are places where he gets frustrated with people. But most of the time, Jesus said what needed to be said, and then he stopped talking, and he walked away. Perhaps Paul gives us the best reason to choose to follow Jesus. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. When we are argumentative, when we choose not to agree with one another, our souls, our spirits are agitated. I know mine is when I've had a disagreement with someone. That peace is not there. It's gone. It's missing. Now please understand I'm not saying that we acquiesce on everything and never stand up for what we believe or feel and end up being a doormat where people walk all over us. That's not what I'm suggesting. But most often when we argue with a person, we are trying to change their mind. And that's not successful. If you doubt what I've just said, take a moment to think about the political rhetoric that's going on between Democrats and Republicans. I could mention names and it would instantly bring a feeling to you, either one of agitation or agreement, depending on what name I mention. As Christians, I don't think that we are in the business of changing minds. We're in the business of changing hearts. And the way that we do that is by showing others the heart of God. By introducing people to this mighty God that we love and serve, and thereby providing an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to make his way into their lives in order to transform them and transform their hearts. So allow me to rework this benediction of Paul's for you today. Farewell, brothers and sisters. Remember that we are all traveling in the same direction, although at different speeds. At times, a fellow traveler might need to exit before you do. 
trust each other to allow this freedom. Keep your eyes on the road and wish people well in their travels. Don't be so focused on your destination that you forget about others on the road with you. At times we might bump into each other, but because we're all traveling together in the same direction, we can handle the collisions. Yes, there are differences, but we share so much more in common. With God's help, we can reach the destination together. Amen.